Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, we're going to talk about Julia Fox, who, if you don't know who she is, no problemo. If you haven't read her book, Down the Drain, also no problem. We're going to go over a little bit of who she is and why, after reading her memoir, I actually kind of liked her less. I know a lot of people really like her, and so I'm not here to, you know, comment on you liking her. That's okay. Instead, I want us to reference to a quote I'm sure you've heard said, a wise person learns from his mistakes, and a wiser person is one who learns from others and the wisest of them all learns from all other successes. And so we want to kind of learn from Julia so we can avoid the mistakes she made. And we want to learn in what ways she was successful so we too can maybe be successful. So there's going to be some good and some bad. Now, of course, before we completely jump in, I am drinking a tea today. So this is a ginger turmeric tea. My partner's been buying it for me and it's really just delicious. It's good cold. It's good warm. I don't even add anything to it like honey or sugar. And so I really like it the way that it is. And it's, I recommend if you haven't read her memoir down the drain, that's okay. You don't have to, to understand Julia Fox and who she is in the story, which is really what we're going to do here on this podcast. You know, I always like to use people's stories to learn more about ourselves. And so we're going to really ask ourselves, who are we in the story? And why is Julia Fox the hero Do I think the villains? And why do I think that Julia Fox is the villain? Let's talk about it. The thing that's interesting about being a celebrity and writing a memoir is that you get to choose how your story is told, or at least in Julia's case, she gets to choose how it's told. And rumor has it, according to certain interviews and articles that I read, according to Slate, she didn't even edit the book, which I think is sort of so Julia, right? (laughs) It's so Julia. Now, Julia told the story of her life in a way that made me like her less. I consumed it via audiobook. It's read by Julia. And I got it through Spotify Premium. It's a part of your account on Premium. I'm not sponsored, but I really like listening to audiobooks there. So you guys can go check it out for yourself. The whole time I was listening to Julia's book, and I needed to take some time off to finish it, I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed with how hard her life was. I was overwhelmed with how many bad decisions she kept making. I was overwhelmed at the incompetence of the adults around her. I was overwhelmed with the fact that she experienced in my mind, like a childhood I would not wish on my enemies and not that I have any enemies, but if I did, I wouldn't want them to have Julia's childhood. It was not a good childhood. And it's interesting because I kept talking to my stream about it and saying, oh my gosh, this book is so interesting and it's so weird and I just don't like Julia very much as a person, but it's so interesting because I liked her so much before. I saw her TikToks and I like her fashion posts and now that I've read her memoir, I'm just confused. Is she a good guy or a bad guy? Because she feels like the villain, but she also feels like the hero of the story. Now, to be fair, the way that Julia talks about herself and who she is in the story, she's always the prettiest basically always the smartest, most talented, trendsetter. She talks about her life as if it's like this great Hollywood story, this great theater production, you know, and she's on Broadway. And so I can't tell if that's the cope from the trauma because I have seen recent interviews with Julia, which are very charming and very lovely. And she says a lot of really self-aware things. Do you think being a man's muse is participating in the patriarchy? For sure. Did you hate being a muse? I wouldn't say I hate it, but I do see how it kind of keeps women in this place of being objects to be fantasized about. You know, I think that when you're a muse, men want to see what they want to see and they don't necessarily see you for who you actually are. And then when they do, when the bubble is burst, They're like, oh, no, you know, you're not my fantasy girl anymore. But then again, it's like as a woman, we kind of have to get it where we can. You know, if I can be amused and get something out of it and advance myself and that's the position I need to be in, I'm going to take it. Throughout her life, she was like the muse in the story for men. She's beautiful, Julia. Julia is a beautiful human. And she used that beauty to get ahead in the world in most basically every facet of her life almost. And so it begs the question, is Julia talented or is she just pretty? I actually think she is talented. I think her fashion is amazing. I actually think she did really good in Uncut Gems, though how hard is it to play yourself? 
Allegedly, she was the inspiration for the character she played on Uncut Gems. Would you consider yourself Ye's muse? <laughs> Um, yeah, a little, maybe. I think what does so. that even mean? To no one that's ever been, because I remember you were like, I. this is not the first time that yeah. I've like, what, what is a muse? I mean, I was Josh Safdie's muse when he wrote Uncut Jazz. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like things like right. that. Just a reminder, the people in that movie are bad people. Like Adam Sandler's a bad person. Julia plays Julia in the movie Uncut Gems and she's a bad person. So I'm not sure that I'd be complimented that my friend wrote a character inspired by me and it ends up being a bad person. But just for the record, She's a bad person in the movie. So it's kind of interesting that Julia prides herself in being this muse. Now, to be fair, I would argue that Julia is the bad person in her life, but also the hero for the villains. She's surrounded by degens. She's surrounded by people that are abusive and cruel to her. She's being taken advantage of by the adults in her life. Her parents are not parenting. And so to be fair, if you were going to survive in a world of villains, you might as well be the hero amongst them, which is the one who got out, the one who sought success, the one who made something of themselves. And without a doubt, that is Julia. Julia made something of herself in a world where mostly no one does. And so for that alone, Julia has to be given her roses because I think statistically she is an anomaly. She beat the probability of her circumstance and the bubble she was raised in. Using Julia as an example of maybe not what to be in the story, but what to become is really somebody who picks themselves up and keeps going even when it's difficult. Now, I'm going to review or at least share some of the reviews that I saw from Google uh, articles, and I'm going to talk to you about people's reaction to Julia to understand sort of who she is in the care, like in the book to other people, who she is in the movie to other people, who she is in our story to other people. But also, if you relate to it, so many of the reviews that I saw about Julia were like, I relate to this. She speaks from the heart. She's so genuine. Keep in mind, throughout down the drain, like throughout her memoir, Julia is stealing from people. She's conning people. She's abusing people. She's bitter and vengeful. She's always looking for ways to hurt people who hurt her. She is not loyal. She is interested in dysfunction. She is dysfunctional. She brags about basically being like a teenage dominatrix, being a little girl who's taken advantage of by an older man. Her first kiss was like at 11 to a guy in his 20s. Her virginity was taken by a guy when she was a young, young teenager who's in his 20s. And it's like one horror story after another, but Julia's sort of bragging about it throughout the story. And I'm not sure if she's doing that because she's coping with the trauma or because people in this bubble are so dysfunctional that it's sort of like they're little wins. But then the misogyny she faces, page after page after page is so clear, but yet the way she voices the, the, the story is almost like with a fondness that is kind of icky to me, I think. Now, to be fair, I wasn't alone in this. Other people also felt this way and then other people loved it and related to it. So from Google, I, you know, I, I have a notepad right here. So I have some notes. So Google reviews, these are one star reviews. Example, this person says this would have been tolerable if it had been fiction, but come on. Next, the author will claim to have crystal clear memories from inside the womb. The drug use is so exaggerated and the prose is so high verbalic that a million little pieces seems like a subtle memoir in comparison. A million little pieces is an infamous book I read many, many years ago that used to be on Oprah Winfrey's, you know, reading list recommendations. And it came out that it was fabricated. A large portion of it was fabricated. A million little pieces is somewhat similar where it's an exaggerated hyperbolic experience of a sort of adventurer, if you will, who engages in promiscuity and drugs and all of these things that as a young virginal person in her 20s who was reading it was like, oh, this is so interesting. Wow. Julia's book feels fami sim like, fami like uh, 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 similar to me where Julia feels like she's exaggerating maybe or maybe she's telling the truth or maybe she's selling me a narrative, but it feels like she's selling me something. And that's interesting to my brain. Now, another one star review said, if you're interested in hearing a terrible person act like a terrible person their whole life and then have everything work out for them in the end solely because they are objectively hot, give this a read. Personally, I find her insufferable after reading this. There's something about it where by the time she got to the artist, Kanye, referenced in the memoir as the artist, once we got to that section of it, I thought to myself, wow, they really are alike, aren't they? She has that Kanye narcissism about her and not to use that word too loosely, let me use a different word. She has that Kanye fantasy about her, that idea that like she set the trend for latex in New York City, that she's she has this God complex about her that isn't as cute as her TikToks are. 
And so I can see that perspective now from people that loved her in the book, four-star reviews, love, love, love this. What a wild, bittersweet autobiography. This woman's life has been absolutely absurd and terrifying. Even from a young age, as she navigates her way through the world, learning how to use herself to get what she wants, she wants to get some new clothes, steals it. She wants to do heroin, bangs a 26-year-old for some. She wants to get her tongue and nipples pierced at age 12, flirts with a piercer and gets it. I could go on and on. I was particularly surprised to hear about her issues with ACE and how she dealt with that or didn't deal with it more like it is so insane to me that she never got any support no matter what stage in her life she was in from being five years old having separated parents having parents to abuse her and each other having to steal to survive and hide whatever money she could to now being 34 years old and one of the highest paid supermodels in the world Truly amazes me to have heard her story and seen how far she's come. Now, the irony of this is so many people in Hollywood, as we're seeing with this Diddy case and everything else, so many of the people who actually do rise to fame did a lot of really bad things to get there. Either they were taken advantage of or they took advantage of other people. Julie is a mix. Julie is a mix of a person who takes advantage of others, but yet she was taken advantage of. And so I'm not sure if she fits right in on Hollywood or if she's actually here to dismantle the patriarchy, which she says in some of her interviews she's done, which I love to hear. But it begs the question, is Julia a person we should be admiring or is she just a person with a troubled life who made something of herself, even though statistically she was going to fail, much like her father, who... We, see, we saw throughout the story was, was never really able to make something of himself the way he dreamed. They're originally from Italy and came to America to make something of themselves. And it never happened. But it did happen for Julia. So did Julia in some ways break that generational curse that her father suffered from in his own way? And that's the question I have there. Now, the irony of how Julia broke that generational curse is genuinely off the backs of men, which is not really helping take down the patriarchy as much as we want to claim it is. It, I don't think it is. Being a man's muse, which she even said in an interview herself, definitely enhances the patriarchy. Julia, as, a, as an older teenager, 19, was a dominatrix. And she was an adult worker. And she had a customer who eventually became a sugar daddy who eventually funded her chance at kind of fame. He helped her with a clothing line that her and her friends had. And that clothing line with a very back and forth, messy beginning, end, and future involved him funding it all, regardless of whether they were dating or not dating, breakups, her threatening him, him sending a PI like to basically stalk her to see what she was up to. It was a very dysfunctional story, but it funded Julia. And then from then on, basically men became the reason Julia ended up becoming something in the world. I think many of us learned about Julia through Kanye which was interesting, but she was only with him a few months. And I understand why they had their moment together. I understand why that happened. And I'm not a big fan of how Ye treats the women in his life, obviously. But with that said, it's obvious that Julia isn't a Kim Kardashian. Julia is something else. She's playing a different kind of game. And I'm not sure she knows what it is because I certainly don't either. Just feels like a dysfunctional person who, because they're willing to break all the rules and take advantage of people, ended up in a position of power and privilege, which is nice, I think. I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to say if Julia is somebody that you could rely on so much as Julia is a person you can rely on to take advantage of any situation to get where she needs to go. So when we talk about who you are in the story, you can decide if you want to be a Julia. Now, moving on to a five-star review in Google, Julia Fox's memoir, Down the Drain, is a raw and unflinching, honest account of resilience and survival that both shocks and inspires. She writes with a directness and authenticity that is, that's as captivating as it is enlightening, inviting readers into the depths of her tumultuous journey from a challenging childhood through a life marked by extreme experiences. Her storytelling powers, powers shines throughout the book, weaving a narrative that is both heartbreaking and profoundly empowering. Julia's willingness, willingness to expose her vulnerabilities and share her truth makes this memoir not just a tale of survival, but a beacon of hope for others facing their own struggles. Moreover, her voice, both literal and literal, literary, carries a beautiful a beauty that reson, uh, resonates deeply, making Down the Drain a must-read. I will say, I can't know how much of the book is true, but I will say, obviously, a lot of it was based off of the people who've come out and talked about Julia and the way that she's expressed herself in interviews. 
And I do think it's amazing to go from rags to riches. I think it's always a great story to be the underdog who rises. Everyone loves a Phoenix story, you know, rising from the flames. But I still feel like we're kind of listening to a story about a villain who rose to prominence. And I'm looking forward to her healing along the way. Now, if you go to something a little bit more serious, The Cut has a part uh, in their article about Julia that says she's not broken by these experiences. They inform her choices, but they're not her entire personality. Instead, Fox is the opposite of a nihilist in a world increasingly committed to the bit that nothing is real. In her memoir, God answers her prayers for sugar daddies and film roles while she upholds her own celestial pinky swear to stop using heroin. And then there are her countless other tethers to Earth, ranging from her Italian grandfather to her photography to her love for New York and dancing and fucking and watching the stars rise and set from raves and houseboats and alleyways. She has experienced so much of life's darkness and her response has been the commitment to living honestly in its light. So she was like a drug user who was going in and out of her drug use. She was trying to figure out reasons to stop. She was in and out of like um, mental hospitals and in and out of jail and in and out of a lot of things. She wasn't reliable. I know she had a struggle with drugs. You know, I think I'm not sure if it's addiction or if that's the word we want to use because I'm not sure how that applies to Julia. I think either way, she was a person who was willing to throw it all away every night of her life to have the best night of her life, but also was hard to plan for the future, given that she was raised by people who couldn't plan for the future, right? It goes on to say she has experienced so much of life's darkness and her response has been committed, a com commitment to living honestly in its light. The, the way that people think she's being honest is such an interesting idea, since she basically tells a story about how she's a liar up until recent times. Like that's the kind of the irony I think about Julia is that I was waiting for the memoir to say, this was 10 years ago, this was five years ago, this was many years ago. But the memoir was like, this is present tense. And I'm like, oh, oh. So there was no time for recovery. There was no time for healing. There was no time to even hold herself accountable. I mean, the book literally ends with her bragging about basically being a fashion icon and making, um, like setting trends as if she's this, I mean, maybe she is in that bubble for sure. But I felt like the way that the book ended was just so egotistical that I was like, are you going to talk about your life or like the fact that you were basically assaulted multiple times by these men or the fact that like, I'm not sure where the accountability for her own thievery came from or like, is she going to talk about how she stole as a young person or how she ruined people's like she stole IDs and um, lived off people's like credit cards and like, you know, is she going to talk about that? It just felt like really weird. Slate said it kind of, Slate kind of had like a negative article about her, but they said there are other parts of the memoir that betray a desperation for respect and admiration. She reports people telling her that everyone is obsessed with you. She claims to have single-handedly started every trend of 2022. And um, in her telling, she charms and dazzles people wherever she goes. Claims that her childhood poetry was good enough that her father managed to get her words published in poetry journals more than once. Tells us that an interview with her was the most clicked on article in the history of one's magazine website. Basically, the book goes on and on and on about how she basically has accomplished all of these amazing things that no one has ever accomplished. And it feels like too good to be true. And I think it just factually probably is. I, I don't know. I, this just feels very like, she's perfect for Hollywood. Her and Ye should have spent more time doing art together. It feels like that, right? Like Julie will be like, I don't care what people think. And then the whole thing's about how she cares about what people think. I think she had to end the book in the way she did because the whole book itself is sort of a reflection of all the bad things that Julia made up until recent history. So it's hard for people, I think, to take away from this book that she's a good person, but maybe just a person who's trying. The last article I want to read from is from Time. There's one thing here that I think is really funny. It says, how many people can say they were permanently banned from Bloomingdale's by the age of 12? That they were a teenage runaway, a dominatrix, a sugar baby before they were 20. From getting her first kiss from a 26-year-old at the age of 11 to the night in high school when she does ecstasy for the first time, accepts a marriage proposal from her drug dealer and gets his name tattooed on her wrist, Fox's recollections are obviously sensational. But what makes them truly compelling is the way she grounds them in a gritty and at times ugly realities of her life. Benders and parties, passionate romances, and deep friendships are flanked by messy betrayals, abusive relationships, miscarriages, arrests, and overdoses. 
As much as Fox is driven by her vices, she's also motivated by her survival, her ambition, and her creative instincts. She uses the money she earns as a sex worker and later as a sugar baby to not only fund her life, but that of her best friends to start a fashion line and pursue her ambitions as a multimedia artist. She also threatens that sugar daddy and basically says, like, if you do not fund my life, I'll ruin yours. So I'm not really sure where the bragging is. Like this rich man comes into her life from the dungeon, wants to treat her lavishly. She dates him, but then wants another guy who's really messed up. And then they go back and forth and he eventually moves on to another girl. And she says, but you still have to fund my life. You have to fund my friend's life. You have to fund our lives. You owe it to me. And it's a very interesting way to tell your story because she basically had to threaten people and basically you better do this or else in order to accomplish a lot of her goals. And at the same time, people did love Julia. She's very charming. I mean, the reason I read this memoir was because I liked Julia. And then I read the memoir and I was like, oh, she's kind of mean and she's kind of like a bad person. And I wouldn't trust her around my purse or my children. She doesn't seem reliable. And then the big, the question, like, who is she in the story? I do think my assessment is correct that she's kind of the hero for the villains. And look, every dysfunctional bubble needs a hero. But at the same time, is this healthy? No. Is this somebody that I think is working on herself and healing? Yes. I've seen countless interviews of Julia who has said that she has participated in contributing to the patriarchy, which we all have. She is trying to be better. She is trying to recontextualize her life. She recently came out as a lesbian. Like she is trying to do better. And I think that's all we can ask of people. If we can even ask that at all. I think what's the most important thing, though, is if you identify with Julia, what does that say about you? If you sit there and say, like, oh, my God, I love her. She reminds me so much of my life. How relatable. What does that tell me about you? Because let me tell you, as I was reading this book, I didn't I don't know anyone like Julia. I'm really lucky. A lot of the people in my life have parents that are together, parents that tried, people that tried. We have a lot of things that we are all working on. Our parents are always dysfunctional because we're all dysfunctional, but it's on a spectrum. And I'm really lucky that my parents weren't as dysfunctional as this. I'm really lucky that I'm not as dysfunctional. The question is, what does it say about you if you identify with Julia? Because I think you should take that as an opportunity to seek out therapy, healing, meditation, introspection. Because truly, it's not that Julia's evil, but I think she's closer to evil than joy in a philosophical sense. Like if you're new to my channel, we focus on the philosophical version or philosophical tool of the self. So you're looking for that version of yourself that's being examined through the philosophical lens versus that moralizing lens. When I say Julia is a bad person, I don't mean she's the worst person who's ever existed. I mean, she's kind of outside of her joy. I don't think vindictiveness and bitterness is a quality of a healed or joyful person. I don't think Julia is lost. I don't think she's without joy. I just think she's not in her joy. She obviously loves her child. She seems to have a weird relationship with the person she made that baby with. I don't want to speak to that. There seems to be weird relationships with everybody in her life. But how would there not be in a world where you come from dysfunction? You know, the irony is we want to blame people for being born into dysfunctional bubbles. But the truth is, is like, they didn't have a choice in that any more than you did not being born into such a dysfunctional bubble. We're all born into dysfunction, but the spectrum varies. So I'm not going to blame Julia for being born Julia. I'm going to praise her and congratulate her on breaking so many expectations. But I'm also going to encourage people who identify with Julia to take that as a sign that you still have some healing to do. Because identifying with a person, the person that Julia explained in the memoir, that Julia, I think that that's a sign that you need you need to really focus on the journey of healing. I don't want people to think they're unlovable if they're a Julia or identify with her. They should instead pay attention to the fact that love comes in all shapes and sizes and forms. But first and, for first and foremost, you have to love yourself. And Julia spent a lot of her life not loving herself, but coping and pretending that she did enough to trick herself into being successful. And that is... That is the most perfect example of fake it till you make it. I really hope Julia now loves herself in a way that her younger self couldn't, but her younger self was fighting demons, fighting bad parents, fighting a system, going back and forth between Italy and America. I mean, I couldn't even imagine this life. It was a horrible childhood. And if you're born into a horrible childhood, it certainly isn't your fault. It's no one's fault. It's how the cookie crumbles. So now that Julia's out of that 
bubble, I hope that she's now at a place where she can fund the right resources in order to get the right kind of help, because it's really what we want for everybody. Now, she was also, um, fun enough, diagnosed with borderline. You guys know I have to diagnose this borderline. Who knows what that ever means, you know, but borderline is a very, um, workable personality disorder. Therapy DBT really helps. You know, a lot of it correlates with meditation, but I'm not surprised she has borderline. She was abandoned by her parents. She was abandoned by men. She was abandoned by herself. She had nothing to sort of go back to. So I'm not surprised. I just hope that the diagnosis got her closer to knowing herself because that Julia that was, you know, using drugs and stealing from people and going in and out of, you know, jail, that Julia, she was suffering and she was surviving. So it sounds like Julia's in her living era, but I'm not quite sure because I don't know her as a person. But if you identify with the Julia in the book, the Julia that was surviving, this tells you more about you than it does Julia. We're not even talking about Julia in this podcast. Girls, we're talking about you. We're just using Julia to have that conversation to face ourselves and say, oh my God, why do I identify with this very dysfunctional woman? And what does that say about me and my relationship to self and my relationship with the people around me? The glorification of wanting to be a celebrity in New York City to the point of using dysfunction, partying, illicit drugs, unconsensual, right, left, and you know, all that stuff that happened. Just so many things happen. It's the dream for some people. It's a nightmare for others. May you be a person in which this is a nightmare for you. I think what we're learning with the Diddy stories coming out and all of Hollywood being just completely unveiled to the rest of us is that all of these people that are seeking fame, who knows what they had to do to get it? In Julia's case, was it worth it? I don't know. Only Julia can answer that, but it will never be worth it for a healed person. I do think you have to be a certain level of dysfunctional and unhealed for you for it to be worth it to you. And the question is, would she want it for her child? Would I want it for mine? I would not wish my childhood, most of my or parts of my childhood on a future generation. But I know we only have the power to break so much of a generational curse every generation. So Julia broke a huge one in hers. And the only hope is that we can continue to break the, ge the generational curses in ours. But it really starts with knowing who you are in the story. There's like this stigma with borderline that I think fits. And it's probably worse for people without the right kind of relationships growing up. Ironically enough, so much of my borderline obviously stemmed from things I internalized as a child growing up. But more than that, it wasn't healed because my parents loved me. It was healed because I loved myself. My borderline has been in remission for like five years now because I learned to love myself. And I think if you look at a Trisha Paytas or you look at Julia Fox or you look at me, we're definitely a spectrum of dysfunction I think Julia being the most dysfunctional, Trisha being the middle and me being the least dysfunctional. And yet we're all still dysfunctional in our own ways. And we all got borderline and we all moved into a better direction. And I think that's all you can ever hope for is that you grow to be more peaceful. You grow to love yourself more and you grow to know who you are in the story. If you don't like who you are in the story, maybe it's time to change it. Because in many ways, that's what Julia did. She looked at her life and thought this can't be the rest of my life. And so she did something with that. And the hope is that we continue to do that until the day we die, because there's always a chance and more symbiosis with our joy, which is, I think, the best goal. I'm not going to make the prescription, but I'm going to make the suggestion to continue to ask yourself, do you want this to be the rest of your life? And if it is, and you're so content, and you're so joyful, and if this was the rest of your life, you'd be so happy. That's beautiful too. Just make sure you get to the point in your life where you wake up every day happy and go to bed every day happy and you realize if this was the rest of my life, this would be a great life. Because that's all you can ever ask for in this very short time we're here. If you guys have comments about Julia's podcast, or po Julia's podcast, Julia's memoir, I'd love to hear it. I probably missed some details or maybe there's more details you'd like to share. I'm not here to try to demonize this woman's journey. I'm here to use it as an example of maybe what wasn't the greatest thing to do, but we can always just hope people get better. The planet is full of 8 billion unique people going through unique journeys. And though nobody is special, we are definitely unique and we are one of a kind and nobody will ever be Julia Fox, but maybe it's good that nobody else will have to be her. 
because maybe she carried the burden of that suffering all on her shoulders so other people wouldn't have to, right? Especially her child. Hopefully so much of the burden that Julia carried doesn't have to be passed down, even though we know some will, because we're not perfect and all of our parents will give us some burden and we will give our kids burdens. And the hope is that we learn to alleviate it generation after generation. I think that Julia says it best. Sometimes you have to say fuck it and throw your life down the drain just to see where you'll come out the other side. The most profound beauty emerges from the ashes of destruction. And by that, I mean that sometimes you have to burn your life to the ground in order to experience a life that was truly meant for you. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate you being here. Please let me know what you guys think about Julia's down the drain. And I'll see you next podcast. Bye. My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth Life is a fool. Da, 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 da.